today's presentation, as described in the abstract, um, deals with the fact that realist research and evaluation is underpinned by realist philosophy and that, as with all methods and methodologies, that philosophy has particular implications for um, how qualitative research is undertaken, uh, in particular for how um, interviews are conducted and how qualitative data is analysed. So what I'm mainly hoping to do in this um, presentation this morning is um, to explain why, as realists, we are not just interested in respondents' experiences or sense-making, as some constructivist approaches are, um, talk a little bit about how realist interviews and samples uh, are themselves constructed, and why thematic analysis is not enough to provide realist analysis. In order to do that, I want to very quickly remind everybody of the three key ideas um, in realism, the ideas of con context, mechanism and outcome. Uh, realism is um, particularly strong as an interpretation of causation or a way of understanding causation. Um, so if we think about holding a tennis ball and dropping it, um, if you drop the ball or let go of the ball rather, um, when you're standing on a tennis court on earth, um, the, the mechanism that draws the ball to earth is gravity. Uh, if you do exactly the same thing, let go of the ball in outer space, the gravitational force of your body is stronger than the gravitational force uh, exerted by anything else and so the ball stays exactly where it was. If you return to earth and let go of the ball underwater then the mechanism of buoyancy is stronger than the mechanism of gravity and the ball floats as a result. Uh, what this means is that the things that we do at the observable level or the things that we can see at the observable level are not in fact the causes of or the direct causes of the outcomes that we see and context determines which underlying causal processes operate and therefore what outcomes are generated. So this is um, a fairly complex slide in which um, I'm trying to present or you remind you of um, some of the key assumptions that underpin a realist philosophy. First of all, realists believe that there is a real world and it is independent of and interdependent with our interpretations of it. It's a different position um, from that of some constructivist positions that end up with the um, belief that we can't tell whether or not there's a real world out there. Um, realists believe that there is. We not only believe that there is, um, but we believe that both the material and the social worlds are real. Um, a kind of quick and dirty way of thinking about what is it that makes something real is if it has real effects, then it in itself must also be real, whether or not it is material. So, for example, gender is real, class is real, and we know they're real because they have real effects, even though they're not material things. Our next assumption is that um, both the material worlds and the social worlds are comprised of complex, open, nested systems. Um, and each of those uh, descriptive terms there has particular implications for how causation works and therefore for how we as qualitative researchers need to go about understanding how things happen in the world. Uh, complex systems imply amongst other things that there will be multiple causes of any event um, and multiple consequences of any event. Open systems imply that we cannot 
close the system as is intended in some forms of research in order to investigate how something works. Uh, the open systems have things moving in and out of them. Their boundaries are porous. Um, and so they are in fact always changing as it is, as we are in the process of trying to investigate what's going on. Next assumption is that there are causal processes at all levels of all systems. And I've put there from the cellular to the interstellar, but they, they certainly go lower than the cellular level as well. Um, causal processes are usually at a different level of the system than the outcome or event that we are investigating. Um, causation works both upwards and downwards in complex systems and in fact across complex systems. But usually uh, the causal forces are at a different level of the system than that which we are observing or explaining. And this has become known in um, realist philosophy as thinking of causal forces and processes as being real but being invisible and or underlying. And that's what the iceberg um, metaphor represents. Um, it's presenting work developed by Roy Baskar who said we can think of reality as comprising three levels. There's the empirical level that which we observe or experience. There's also the actual level. These are things that happen um, whether or not we observe them, whether or not we experience them. So the realist answer to did the tree fall over in the forest? There really is a forest. Um, did it make a, <laughs> to the realist answer to the question, did the tree make a sound when it fell over in the forest? Sorry, there really is a forest. There really was a tree, it really did fall over, and it really did cause the difference in air pressure that would be interpreted as sound by a human ear, were there a human ear there to hear it. But then the next level down is what Baskar called the real, and the real comprises, um, the real in fact includes actual and empirical, they're nested levels. Uh, but the real is the level at which underlying causal structures, forces and processes operate in order to generate the um, objects and events that we see um, at the empirical level or that exist at the actual level. So if that's Realism 101, how do we um, understand that if we're thinking about researching or evaluating policies or programs. Program activities operate at the empirical level. They are things that are done um, and that we can observe. We can see the teacher standing in front of the class um, or the counsellor providing counselling. They are by definition therefore not mechanisms. The realist understanding is that those program activities provide some kind of resource opportunity or constraint which then interacts with something inside the human head, reasoning in the sense of logic in use, preferences, norms, beliefs, um, and those, the interaction between what the program provides and the something inside people's heads change changes decisions or choices which lead to new behaviours which generate program outcomes. So that's Pawson and Tilly's construct of a program mechanism. As with all other mechanisms, program mechanisms only operate if the context is right. Now the context does not mean the setting or the location. If I'm in evaluating health research programs, the hospital or the community health centre is not the context, it's the setting. But there might be things about the way the setting operates that do affect whether, how and which mechanisms fire. And those elements of the implementation context do count as context for a realist. Similarly, there are things about individuals, their culture, their gender, their personal history, the resources they have available to them that influence how, the, uh, how they reason and therefore the decisions that they make. 
And there are things in the communities and societies around them, um, politics, economics, the level of stability and violence in a community at a particular point in time, which also influence how people reason and the choices that they make. Even where um, programs uh, get to the point where participants or targets are making the decisions that the program would like them to make, the last aspect of context is that the opportunities and resources to enact those decisions uh, and to keep enacting those decisions usually um, have to be available. We can train unemployed people until we're blue in the face. If there's no jobs there, they're just better trained unemployed people. So it is the interaction between multiple forms of context uh, interacting with or influencing the reasoning of subjects of the program and that in turn interacting with the uh, local context and whether or not opportunities and resources are available that creates the pattern of program outcomes and pattern is underlined there because as realists we are not so interested in on average answers we are interested in explaining how and why different outcomes are created in different contexts. So that's the reminder session for um, realist uh, philosophy and particularly realist ontology um, and how it is made manifest in um, realist research and evaluation program related, policy and program related. What I want to turn to now is realist epist epistemology. And um, this is a debated area. There are um, realists who believe that realist epistemology and constructivist epistemology are the same. And there are realists who believe that the constructivist epistemology and realist epistemology have a lot in common, but they are not the same. Um, and I fall into the latter camp. So the bits on which we agree, uh, we realists and constructivists agree, that all knowledge is um, kind of, I want to say, of course, <laughs> socially and individually constructed. And all input through our senses, all experience, is interpreted through the lens of our previous knowledge and experience. And therefore, of course, we all um, draw different conclusions or uh, end up, yeah, we draw different conclusions on the basis of the same experience. If you follow a pure constructivist epistem epistemology, uh, what the next step in the logic is, and what that means is there's no way to choose between two competing versions of reality. There's no way to choose between my interpretation and my friend next to me's interpretation of what just happened, even though they are likely to be different. As a result of that, we can't really know what reality is really like. There's no way to determine which interpretation is correct. And the end point of that for constructivist research is that the researcher's role is to understand and faithfully report the meanings and interpretations that subjects attribute to their experiences. The school of realism in which I fit takes a slightly different position. We agree, as I said before, that knowledge is socially and individually constructed and interpreted. However, if there is a real world out there, as we believe there is, and that reality is independent of our interpretations of it, then we can use it to construct ways that we can test our knowledge of it and thereby gradually improve our understanding of it. Um, and this, in fact, seems to me to be the purpose of uh, research and evaluation activities. We, we want to be able to improve our knowledge and understanding of what it is that is, I was about to say, out there, but it actually includes in here, it includes inside humans. And as realists, our role is to understand um, the causal processes by which outcomes were generated and why they differ in different contexts. And so the meanings that subjects attribute 
to their experiences of, for example, participating in this program are relevant insofar as they tell us something about some aspect of our program theory. However, uh, the other layer of this is we expect that um, participants will be able to tell us something about their experiences, but there are underlying causes operating within the human brain, just as there are at any, in any other level of any other system, if you're a realist. So what are some of those underlying causes that might be shaping the way that people reason or respond? Well, there are an awful lot of them, but I've just listed three here. We know that humans' attachment style, which is formed during their infancy as a result of um, their interactions with their closest caregivers, uh, ends up being physically myelinated into their brains, structured into our brains, and that it goes on shaping beliefs about ourselves, about others, about whether other people are trustworthy, about relationships, and that it has significant sequelae in multiple behaviours and life outcomes. It's not immutable, it can be changed over time, but most of us are not aware of our attachment style and how it shapes our interactions with other people. Uh, Second example is scarcity. There's recent and very powerful research that um, has identified that when we experience something we value as being scarce, be that money or the company that we were um, experiencing through our relationship before we separated just recently, whatever it is that we experience as being scarce both dominates our thinking and affects the quality of decision making. Um, to the equivalent of being drunk or having missed a night's sleep, which was interesting, I thought. Third example is cultural cognition, which refers to the tendency of individuals to conform their beliefs about disputed matters to the values that define their cultural identities. And cultural cognition has been demonstrated to work through at least two um, mechanisms. One is biased assimilation. We notice um, and accept those things that affirm the beliefs that we already had. And we find more credible the uh, people who are members of groups that we consider ourselves to be members of. So we find members of in-groups credible and trust what they say, but less so members of out-groups. Now, uh, for realists, um, these underlying um, things that shape um, our understandings or shape the way that we as humans re reason that we are not necessarily conscious of or aware of operate as contexts. They fire their own mechanisms which affect our reasoning, our decision, the products of our brains, how we feel. And because of that, we can, in appropriate investigations, use those to help us understand subgroup, subgroups um, within the, the target group that we're investigating and things about the context, because these are contexts, that shape how and why uh, people respond as they do and therefore how and why the whatever we're investigating works. Um, and there are formal theories about these things and that for some of them there's quite a, a large body of research and we can use those formal theories and the previous research to help build our explanations and um, of the patterns of outcomes that we are interested in. Now this brings us to an interesting question. How do we as realists um, position ourselves in relation to the status of talk? So do we, for example, think that talk represents honest, straightforward answers to the questions that we have asked and therefore, um, if you like, immediate data that we don't have to do terribly much with uh, to use in our investigation? 
or do we think that talk reflects social circumstances and social situations and therefore, for example, if you interview somebody, that is in part constructing the answers that you get. Um, I think, as a realist, uh, that we are left in a position where we have to admit, as realists, that the cognitive or psychological realm of humans is real, that human reasons and reasoning can, although it doesn't always, form a basis for actions in the world, and that participants talk, things that participants or targets, subjects say, may reflect their real attitudes, beliefs and reasons, which may in turn underpin their action. That is, that talk might demonstrate program mechanisms. But we already know that what shapes, some of what shapes reasoning may be unconscious and, and participants might not be able to tell us about that. Concurrently, as realists, we also have to acknowledge that the social world is real and that it does structure the ways that uh, people think and respond and that talk does serve multiple social purposes, including defending ourselves or seeking to protect the program that we think is a good thing. Um, and therefore, talk may reflect the respondent's purposes in the particular interaction, uh, rather than being an accurate description of um, their reasons for behaviour or their motivations or whatever it might be. And that leaves us as realists in a position where uh, we have to make um, judgments about the explanatory value of what has been said. And that explanatory value may or may not relate uh, to the meaning that the respondent attributed to an experience. And uh, that is where a realist evaluation or a realist piece of research differs from a constructivist piece of research. So we are operating on the realist assumption that causation is operating at all levels of all systems all the time. So what the participants tell us about their own reasoning is in fact only ever a part of the causal story. Uh, that humans are not conscious of all aspects of their reasoning. And so even when they are doing their absolute utmost, as I believe many people do, to tell us the truth as they see it, there is more going on that they may not be aware of. And that communication is shaped by social context and um, purpose. And some of those purposes are going to be helpful to us and some are going to be unhelpful to our analytic task. We are the ones who are responsible for making the judgments about how what we are being told um, contributes to our analysis of how X generates Y in what contexts. So having taken that as our um, starting point, I just want to um, say a couple of things very quickly about what that means for how we construct um, interviews. Um, realist interviewing um, and realist program theory are theory-based approaches. Um, when we're trying to conduct, uh, construct our initial piece of theory, I've called it program theory here, but it, it can actually apply to any kind of theory. Um, when we're trying to construct our initial program theory, how do we do that? An initial program theory says, so how is this thing supposed to work? How do we think that it works? And you can get qualitative data about that from people who wrote a program, people who are um, paying for a program, uh, the people who are running and implementing the program, and from documentation and previous research and evidence. But when you move from developing your initial rough theory to collecting the evidence to test that theory, the nature of the question changes from how is this supposed to work to how is this actually working, for whom and in what circumstances, if you're answering the realist questions. 
And now who you can get the information from changes. You can still probably talk to program managers and staff. Now you can talk to program participants and other stakeholders who are close enough to the program to have information about what's happening. And you can draw on administrative records and photographs and all sorts of other data as well, both qualitative and quantitative, of course. When you move into the analysis phase, we are not going to be purely inductive or purely deductive in our theory testing. Uh, realist analysis is about understanding underlying causes which by definition we can't see. And so we need to be moving between um, inductive and deductive reasoning and using our intuition, our hunches, which we build into partial explanations, which we then test again. Um, and building this best possible explanation of always incomplete evidence using a combination of induction, deduction and uh, informed hunches, informed intuition is known as retroduction. Um, and so the uh, analytic techniques that we use in realist work are not necessarily exactly the same as um, in other forms of qualitative interviewing. The final task is, of course, to refine our theory. So we'll be answering questions like how, for whom, in what context, in what respects, to what extent, at what cost, borne by whom, depending on the nature of the uh, investigation that you're taking. And those, over what time scale? Uh, those um, re refinements of theory are done both against the initial rough theory that you developed in the first stage of re your research and potentially against formal or substantive theory. And that means that we construct our samples to test the theory. Uh, you might use um, different forms of sampling when your theory is not well developed. So you might, for example, develop a cluster theory, or, uh, a cluster sample, sorry, or a maximum diversity sample. Um, in order to get diversity of responses to develop an initial rough theory. But once your theory is well enough developed, uh, you sample for the contexts or the population groups that are identified in the theory in order to be able to test the theory. And what that means is that we are not seeking to build something that is representative or generalizable in the usual sense of the word and we don't use random samples. We do try to allow for iteration and so when you're constructing your sample working out how many interviews you're going to have all up, um, it is a better idea usually to have a smaller number of interviews in your early rounds and have room to iterate, to go back and collect further information as your theory develops and refines. The nature of the interview is, always, is also slightly different. In a constructivist interview, you want to find out what the participant's experience was and how they interpret it. In a sense, the participant is the subject of the interview. That's slightly overstating it, but I'm trying to make a point. For um, a realist interview, the topic of the interview is the program theory. And so everything that you are asking is about gathering data that will help you to support, refute or refine, build in the first place, or then support, refute or refine uh, the program theory that you are investigating, the piece of theory that you're investigating. Uh, we normally um, suggest that you start with pretty open questions on the topic that you're investigating. In realist uh, interviews, it is okay to prompt with examples or to prompt with explicit statements of pieces of the program theory in order for the participant to be able to engage with you in a conversation about the theory and how it applies in this particular set of circumstances. Um, and some people get anxious there about um, the interviewer leading the interview, 
but the idea is that we need to be able to present different bits of program theory in such a way that it enables the participant to say, yeah, no, it doesn't quite work like that here though, and to tell us the story of um, how it works for them or here or whatever it might be. Second thing is that um, different people know about different things and so and it is necessary to ask people about the things that they know about. Uh, if they haven't actually been engaged in the program, they can't tell you about the program. Um, if uh, they can tell you about other things, than what they need or want or what they would like from a program or whatever, but they can't tell you about the program if they haven't been engaged with it. Um, the people who run the program will have different information to offer than the people who participate in the program and so on. And so, um, similarly to most forms of constructivist interviewing, we are going to ask them about what they know about, but it's not going to be an open-ended, you take the interview where you like uh, approach. It's going to be asking them about what they know about, about the program theory. And then we seek in the interview to identify and explore differences. Um, now that can, can include differences for different people, for different groups, but it also can include differences for the same people in different contexts. Um, is it easier to do X sometimes than at other times? Does Y work with one of your children but not with the other of your children? Uh, which of your staff um, find it, no, in what, in what circumstances do your staff find it easier to do X or Y? And of course it's really important, as with other forms of interviewing, that you're not express expressing either positive or negative judgments, but curiosity and exploration of when is it different and how and why is it different. Um, the next assumption is um, we're trying to get inside people's heads, we're trying to understand their reasoning in order to understand how the causal process works. Only uh, the person themselves can tell you about their reasoning. They can't tell you everything about their reasoning, but they are the only person who can tell you about their reasoning. Um, and they are probably better placed, although not always, to talk to you about the things that lie behind and support their reasoning or the things that affect the aspects of their reasoning. Um, and as I've said already, we, we want to try and iterate as we evolve our theory, as we ref gradually refine our theory, it is desirable to be able to go back um, and um, talk to people that you have previously interviewed again about, hey, what about this bit? You can also iterate actually within the interview sample. You can learn something in yesterday's interview and test it with a different person in today's interview and that's entirely legitimate. What does it mean for analysis? Um, as I've already talked about, um, we use reproductive analysis in realism um, because analysis is an ongoing process um, of building, testing and refining theory which goes on through the entire research or evaluation project. From the moment you start talking about what are we trying to find out here, um, that you're starting to be good build theories that you are then going to test. And we are looking uh, to go behind or underneath what is observable to find out what it is that's going on at the level of the real, what's the causal process. The realist standards, international standards for um, realist evaluation suggest that we as analysts need to be able to describe in detail how our data were analysed. Um, we have to be able to say how did we identify constructs, how did we analyse them, how did we develop the theory and if we changed our analytic methods as we were going through this process of theory refinement then we need to be able to describe that as well. And that means that we've got a series of data, uh, a series of analy um, analysis process decisions to make, as you do with any other form of analysis. We need to be clear about what kind, what data we're going to extract or code, and why. 
how we're going to record it in such a way that it will enable us to identify the linkages between context, mechanism and outcome, exactly how we're going to go about analysing it. And then once we've got data and analysis, how we are going to synthesise our findings within and across data sets. The analytic tasks that we're engaged in as realists are explanatory. It, it, they are not descriptive or they are not solely descriptive. We have to explain the outcomes by identifying the mechanisms that create them. Now, by logical implication, mechanisms can't be identified without reference to particular outcomes. The mechanism is what causes this particular outcome. And for realist philosophy, context doesn't directly affect outcome, it affects mechanisms, which means that this, what matters about context, the significant aspects of context, can't be identified without reference to mechanism. And that implies a logic of analysis. You don't have to follow it rigorously every time, all the time. But the logic is identify the outcomes first, move back from that to identify the mechanisms that cause the outcomes, uh, move back from that to identify the elements of context that affect the mechanisms, and then align all of your constructed bits of context mechanism outcome against your program theory uh, and move to be able to identify the interactions within the CMOs and context mechanism outcome statements and between them. The analytic strategy that we use, uh, particularly in evaluation, is intra-program or uh, in a piece of re in a research project, it's in within the project intergroup comparisons according to the program theory that we're investigating. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we have a piece of program theory that says the main mechanism that operates in this program is social capital, the program builds social capital which then results in dot dot dot, where we don't see an increase in social capital, we shouldn't see an increase a change in outcomes, where we see an increase in social capital, we should see a change in outcomes. So knowing that that is what we are going to investigate and test, we will have collected data about social capital and then we will um, analyse whether and for whom, which bits of, what kinds of social capital have increased and whether or not that change in social capital is in fact at least associated with um, a changed outcome. This means that we are not just doing thematic analysis. Uh, one of the things, one of the tests that we look, look for when we're assessing is this a realist piece of work or not is whether or not people say we did all this, this, this and this and then we did a thematic analysis. Themes are looking for what is common. They are looking to build convergence on meaning. Uh, realists are looking for what is different here rather than what is common and why is it different. So if we're seeing different outcomes, that implies different mechanisms. Um, or if in our program theory we have hypothesised that different contexts will affect whether and how this works, we can look for the contextual differences and work forward from that. Now, of course, there will, there will end up being themes because there are, quote unquote, patterns in the outcomes, patterns in the data. But the themes will be within contexts or groups and not necessarily across them. We want to build our explanations in disaggregated, middle range theory levels of abstraction. There are a bunch of different approaches, um, analytic strategies that you can use to uh, get there. You can use a modified form of analytic induction, uh, which works by um, choosing a rich first um, case, developing um, your program theory from that first case, and then modifying the theory, which means 
for a realist, adding bits of context or mechanism or outcome or their interaction uh, with the data from each subsequent interview. You can use theory-based matrices where you set out elements of the theory and uh, the data that you get from each respondent in relation to that element of the theory. Uh, if you're theory building, you can use a modified form of um, grounded theory, although you do, in, uh, in both cases of analytic induction and grounded theory, they do have to be modified to make them appropriate for realist use. Um, one of the assumptions of grounded theory, for example, is that you start uh, with, no, with as few preconceptions as you possibly can and build your theory entirely from the data. Whereas realists are assuming, well, we're starting with a theory about how causation works um, in the broad sense, the philosophical sense, and that structures the nature of the questions that we're asking, the nature of the analysis that we're trying to do. So um, you've got at least a preliminary structure for your theory as a result of that. And you also, of course, need to keep protecting disaggregation. How is it different in different contexts? as you move through or up the process of building theory uh, from the data. So um, very quick couple of final slides. Uh, what do we look for when we're analysing for context? When we're analysing for context, we're looking for what affects whether and which mechanisms fire. So there's a bunch of um, dot points below that on the slide that you can see where Parents uh, being interviewed about a parenting program talked about things, a variety of different things, their own upbringing, whether or not they'd been to other programs, what's going on for their kids, their own attitudes to and expectations of their kids, etc. But in each case, you can also see a re there, a red re, with reference to, in relation to. What is the mechanism um, or that I am trying to get at by understanding this bit of um, context information that I've got from the parents? So um, I'm not going to go through the whole slide because it would take too long, but in each case we have to be able to say what bit of the, what mechanism, what bit of our causal program theory is this piece of context affecting? When you're analysing for mechanism, if you're using Pawson and Tilly's construct of program mechanisms and interaction between the resources, opportunities and constraints that the program provides and the reasoning of the uh, respondent, resources might be material, financial, social, psychological, intellectual, um, whatever, money. Um, but they are also likely to be new to the participant. The, the logic for saying that is that if the participant already had access to those resources, they might already be doing uh, what it is that the program is seeking for them to do. So it's likely to be something that's new to them and that has enabled or facilitated a change, not necessarily the intended change, but a change. And for the reasoning, you are looking for whatever it is inside their heads. It's a catch-all term. It doesn't just mean logic in use. It includes attitudes, values, beliefs, norms. But they are in response to the program or initiative, their experiences in the program or initiative, and that are changed as a result of the and or are changed as a result of the initiative that lead to the different decision and therefore the different behaviour and therefore the different outcome. Um, <laughs> this reading for mechanisms slide I'm going to leave with you for your own um, practice later. I when I read these um, uh, paragraph extracts from three different participants in the same program, see at least two underlying mechanisms um, that are at play there. And I'm going to leave it with you as an exercise. Uh, and you can ask me questions about it later if you wish. How do we analyse for the interactions between context, mechanism and outcome? 
Well, the first one is where uh, the first way is when participants actually tell you here's <laughs> here's the interaction in the way that they structure their sentences. They tell you here's the interaction. So a good teacher, if they're talking down to you all the time, then it won't sink in because you get your back up and that's it. You seal off, you shut off. So here we have an interaction between something that about the way the intervention, the teaching is being de um, delivered, that affects the response, you get your back up. And then that's it, it you seal off, therefore it doesn't sink in, that's the outcome, um, and the learning doesn't happen. Sometimes it's not quite that explicit, um, but um, you've got the two ideas in the same sentence or paragraph. In the last couple of weeks, I've got the courage mechanism to stand up to people, be assertive in my behaviour, that's an outcome. Uh, Sometimes people refer back when you're asking them about um, how do you reckon that happened, they will say, you know how I said earlier about dot, 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 dot. Um, that is drawing the link for you. It is enabling you to see the interaction, at least uh, as they think it happens. And so, and the other technique that you can use is relying on, again, the structure of language, conjunctions, and, but, because, if, when, so, those words tell us that there are um, interactions between ideas um, that help us in our analytic task. Having analysed the data within um, an, in an interview, um, we then need to synthesise the data across interviews. And bearing in mind that we are looking for patterns uh, or groups of outcomes, um, that can be patterns across participants, but also the ways that outcomes group um, within for individual participants and for groups of participants. Uh, we are trying to find out which mechanisms across our data set are associated with which outcomes and have our explanation of how we justify the fact that they are associated. The contexts that are associated with the mechanisms, and again, we have to be able to justify why we're saying that they are. Um, and then we need to move back to and formalise our um, explanation of how and why our data implies refinement to program theory and offer that refinement. And in many cases, um, that will be more usefully done or easily done if it refers back to formal or substantive theory. So Pawson, for example, used reference group theory to uh, explain how different groups respond differently to naming, shaming and faming uh, initiatives. Naming, shaming and faming being um, an overarching mechanism that turns up in many um, interventions. Attachment theory can be used to explain how different groups of parents respond in different ways to family support and parenting programs. Cultural cognition theory that I talked about uh, earlier can explain how people respond differently to the same uh, information. So we can use um, formal theories to help us build our explanations of the different patterns of outcomes that we have found. So in summary, realism is a philosophy. It's not a method, um, but it has implications for methodology and methods. Um, the purpose of realist investigations is explanatory, not just descriptive. The subject of a realist interview is a piece of theory or some pieces of theory. We construct our samples purposively so that we can test our theories. Our interview questions are developed to explicate our theories about how and why things work differently in different contexts. Our analytic methods depend on the stage of theory development, um, but involve retroduction, not just induction or deduction alone. And the product that we are seeking to, to produce is a refined theory, a refined explanation. Thanks very much for your time in listening to the presentation. Um, my, I'll leave my contact details up on the screen in case anybody wants to get in touch with me later. But for now, I'll hand back to Ricardo.
Thank you very much, Jill. I have a question from Tammy, and Tammy, I will I will try to give you the microphone so that you can uh, you can say that question out loud. So let me open your microphone, Tammy. Uh, you would have to click on the microphone icon next to your name, Tammy, in order to open the microphone. Try that. Well, if it doesn't work, what I will do is I will read the question out loud. And the question is as follows. Uh, what do you mean that causal processes work upward and downward? Uh, so, if you think about um, the structure of um, systems, every system is comprised of smaller systems and itself then makes up part of a larger system. So, if we use a human um, as our uh, intermediate level of system that we're thinking about, Every human is comprised of a set of subsystems. We've got a limbic system, we've got a skeletal system, we've got a uh, neural and nerve um, system. And without those systems um, and those systems operating, we don't have the system that we call a human. But every human is then part of a series of other systems. Most of us are part of families, children go to schools, schools are part of a larger system again, an education system, families are part of communities, communities are part of societies. You can do this with any kind of system. Ideas, individual ideas are part of belief systems, belief systems are part of cultures, etc, etc, etc. So um, everything is made up of these multiple levels of systems which are open and interacting. Uh, things at lower levels of systems can cause outcomes or contribute to outcomes at the next level up of a system. Uh, the really obvious example in terms of the human would be if my circulatory system fails and I have a heart attack, I die. The outcome is at the next level up of the system, even though it was a lower level system uh, that failed. Uh, but causation also works downwards in systems. So, for example, in the education system, they set policies about what schools are allowed to do, which shapes what schools do. So, um, there is downwards causation operating from the education system level. There is also upwards causation um, happening within the school where, for example, um, teachers identify a problem and come up with a new strategy about what it is that they're going to do differently to try and overcome that problem. And those strategies are based in their beliefs and reasonings about what is likely to uh, work. So we've got upwards causation happening uh, both within the individual teachers and from the teacher to school level. So causation works both upwards and downwards within systems is what that meant. Thank you very much. Uh, Cherie said, thanks for that, Jill, clear and incredibly helpful. Uh, now I will try to give the microphone to Ida Montenegro. She is in Germany. So uh, let me, let me, let me try. Uh, you are unmuted, Ida. Go ahead. Yes. Well, it may be that your microphone is not connected, so let me read this out loud. Do you have any example, such as article or research, that uses uses this exp uh, um, this exploratory process? <laughs> there are now hundreds of examples of um, realist research and uh, evaluation. Uh, in terms of evaluation itself, if you just Google the word realist evaluation and a topic that you are interested in, uh, you can almost always pull up um, something that's been done in terms of realist evaluation. Um, realist research more broadly um, often goes under the name critical realist research 
And the word critical means um, two different things. Sometimes it means a particular political position. Sometimes it means a particular analytic um, position. But there's a lot of um, realist slash critical realist research that's done in sociology, for example. Um, so yes, there are hundreds of examples now and they are, relatively speaking, easy to find. As well as finding uh, the examples though, <laughs> I personally recommend um, having a look at the standards for um, realist evaluation if you're doing primary research and realist synthesis if you're doing um, literature reviews. There's a whole approach to how you do um, realist literature reviews. Um, and just check the piece of work that you're reading against those standards because there are a lot of things that are using the name realist, but they are not taking uh, all those uh, assumptions, or they're not, they're not making all the same assumptions as I've just presented. Um, there's a series of fairly common mistakes, um, and they often grow out of words having multiple meanings. So um, a lot of people will describe program activities or strategies as being mechanisms because that's what we used to call them. You know, we've introduced a new funding mechanism, the government will say. That's not mechanism in the sense of um, realist causal mechanism. That's a different use of the word. So um, those misunderstandings of things like um, things that people do in a program are a mechanism uh, you need to watch out for. So but there's a lot of examples out there. Thank you very much and we have come to the end. So I would like to thank all of you for coming today and um, before we say goodbye let me ask my colleague Yvette McWatt from IIQM to say a few words. Hi, thanks Ricardo and thank you very much Jill for that wonderful presentation. Just want to let everyone know about the next um, masterclass webinar which will be uh, July 13th at 9 a.m. and that would be with uh, Kakali Bachakara and her topic will be developing critical expansive awareness with contemplative arts-based qualitative research. So hopefully we'll see you all next month. Thank you Yvette. And uh, Jill would you like to say a few last words at the, at the end of this presentation? You have to unmute your microphone. I was. I was laughing and saying I think I've talked quite enough already. <laughs> I am genuinely um, okay with people making um, contact with me. I do recommend that people have a look at the Ramesses website um, because that's the uh, the website is ramessesproject.org. Um, that is the website that has the um, international standards for realist evaluation and realist review and it also has a bunch of training materials on it um, and more coming in terms of the training materials. Uh, so uh, in the next mm, few weeks I expect a series of resources on realist interviewing and realist analysis, retroduction, those sorts of things will be going up on that website. Uh, we've deliberately tried to make the new round of training materials accessible. So we've written short pieces, about a thousand words each, on some of those um, uh, sort of tricky bits in realist stuff. Uh, and I, I would really recommend that people have a look at that. But I'm also happy to respond to questions. But perhaps the final thing I would say is there is in fact um, a discussion list available through the um, Ramesses website. and people do use it and people do respond helpfully to questions that go up there. So that might be another way to get um, further access to uh, resources, information and support about using realist approaches. Thank you very much and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we, we would appreciate or we, or we would be happy to have you come back to, uh, to the next presentations and if you go to the IIQM website uh, you will find the archived webinars that go back to 2000 and um, 2000 and let me see 14 I believe uh, so it's a long long history and uh, this program is possible because of your participation so thank you very much all of you and goodbye